Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mark Rudolph, Sounds Chief Experience Officer. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's COVID-19 clinical webinar. We hope that those of you who weren't working were able to enjoy the holiday weekend, and if you were holding down the fort, thank you very much. As always, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please, if you could submit your questions via the webinar control panel at any time during the presentation. And then we are recording the webinar and we'll send it out via email to all invitees with a link to the recording as well as the resources that are mentioned. At this time, uh, I'd like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Gregory Johnson, Chief Medical Officer of Hospital Medicine, Dr. Nate Ruck, Chief Medical Officer of Emergency Medicine, and Dr. Sergio Zanotti, Chief Medical Officer of Critical Care for Sound. And with that, I will turn it over to Greg Johnson. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the introduction. And as we have always started off these webinars, our first objective is to make sure that we're thanking all of you for your continued work. Uh, we continue to highlight the pictures of the fantastic people that are in this organization and really improving the quality of the patient's care in the communities that we serve across the country in uh, all of our service lines. And we're uh, ever so grateful as a leadership team and as an organization. So thank you for all that you're doing and thank you for being here. We'll next get give you visibility into the agenda by now. I hope that most of you or our regular attendees are familiar with the agenda as it stands. Uh, the first is just an update of where we are with respect to the COVID response in sound, uh, an update with respect to vaccines, our testing updates, and then our traditional clinical update. As we have with every webinar, we are also making sure that we're taking time to pay attention to clinician well-being and uh, making sure that we're providing everybody ongoing visibility as to the organization's support of you in the field uh, as we are continuing to respond to the COVID pandemic. So flipping into the sound update, I want to make sure that everybody uh, is reoriented to a slide that, again, I hope everyone has some level of familiarity with, um, and that is our active admission uh, and ongoing admission trends uh, for our COVID-19 patients in hospital medicine and emergency medicine. Uh, as was asked in a prior webinar, we don't have visibility into, what well, we do have visibility, but we don't track the volumes uh, specifically to our emergency department uh, colleagues simply because they're not on Sound Connect and there is very specific uh, tracking uh, algorithms that are in Sound Connect to make sure that we are capturing suspected and confirmed COVID-19 cases. These go back, please. And the the lines do represent where we are um, since Sound has responded. So you can see um, right now, sort of bimodal curves. The first one um, in and around the second week of March, um, and then the subsequent one around the Fourth of July weekend. Uh, I know that we were pretty happy to see a downtick, but we are seeing an uptick in terms of cases that are both suspected and confirmed. We're keeping a very close eye on this. The next slide gives a sense of where we are seeing these uh, changes in terms of total patients. Again, if you have access to sound metrics or if you're not a, a chief, we want to make sure that you uh, are working with your chiefs to get visibility should you want it. Um, but if you go forward to the next slide, um, we are keeping very close idea, uh, eye on the weekly changes that are occurring. Uh, while a lot of the country is focused on the Southwest, uh, the deep Southeast in Florida and Georgia, as well as in Texas, for our changes over the last week, we've seen a significant uptick in Ohio and Michigan. Um, and the sites that are highlighted to the left uh, are indicative of that. We are watching the sites that have weekly percentage changes. You can see one site has a 2,050% increase. It's a relatively small site, but you can see a significant number of patients, 41, um, that uh, they've increased. Uh, we're using this 
uh, data on an ongoing basis to make sure that not only are we having a regional response, but we're also having uh, an organizational response to make sure that we're adequately supporting our sites uh, in Sound's overall response to uh, COVID-19. The last slide is one with uh, that again, I hope everyone has familiarity with. I apologize, I'm not sure why the mortality one is only highlighting uh, what is going on in the 85 to 109 range. Um, that was unintentional. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we have noted in the mortality is, again, we're seeing our data is very consistent with what we have seen across the country uh, in other reported areas where the uh, greater than 65 uh, is where our highest mortality is. Uh, again, we are seeing a lot more confirmed cases in the 40 to 54 year old range. Um, but um, there's not been a, a significant change in this data uh, since we've been reporting this for the last couple of months. I'll now transition into the vaccine update and uh, moving forward to the next slide, we have maintained the, sort of the same reporting mechanism just in order to make sure that people continue to have familiarity to what we've been stating previously. Uh, and also so that way there's some level of consistency. Uh, again, this is the phenotype of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, and a big focus on the receptor binding domain, which uh, <clears throat> um, and very specifically the spike protein that's associated with it is where many of the vaccines are being, uh, that are being developed are targeting. Uh, we'll discuss some that are uh, mRNA uh, vaccines others that um, are inactivated viruses, um, and then we'll also uh, discuss some of the vectored vaccines, as well as something that is a little bit new uh, in terms of the, that is being explored uh, in the world of vaccines. So moving forward, we've highlighted this particular slide um, that is the status of clinical trials. This is from the New York Times, found this to be a pretty reliable source of information in terms of tracking the various phases of clinical trials that are ongoing. And if you go forward to the next slide, we're really focusing on what's in phase three and the limited approval uh, areas. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, we couldn't go through every single potential uh, clinical trial that exists out there, but this is a very useful way for us to be able to go through. And I won't even be going through all 12, uh, just a survey of the information that we have to date. So first I'll discuss approved vaccines for limited use. And this is from, uh, this is a, a replica of the slide that we produced a little over a month ago, um, where we had, I had put in air quotes, around uh, approved. And these are vaccines that are approved, just not necessarily approved in the United States. CanSino Pharmaceuticals uh, has developed a vaccine. It's based on the uh, AD5 adenovirus and they completed phase one and phase two trials. Many people are combining phase one and phase two trials to get an initial safety profile. And these were reported out in Lancet at the end of July. The Chinese military did approve this vaccine uh, in June 25th, uh, on June 25th, as a special need drug. And going forward, the, the updates that have come from this have to do with the, the following. Uh, there are phase three trials that are ongoing now, uh, and they include, they're outside of China, and I include Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Um, it's a significant number of participants, around 40,000. But with all of the vaccines that I'll be highlighting throughout this portion of the webinar, I am giving people an idea of the estimated primary completion date. These are in, when anybody is registering for phase one, two, or three trial, there's documentation of an idea of when, are, when is the cutoff. And I believe that this provides us visibility as to when even the possibility of these uh, various vaccines being available. Um, and it also just provides visibility um, in terms of what our response is going to be. So um, this one isn't uh, until December of uh, next year. The second approved vaccine, you can go forward a slide, is um, one that I think a lot of people have heard about in the lay press. And it involves, uh, it's 
uh, a lot of people are calling it the Russian vaccine, but the, the original formal name is GAM COVID VAC. Uh, you see that highlighted uh, or in bold in the second line. Um, and this, the clinical trial started in June. It's a c combination of two adenoviruses engineered with coronavirus gene. Lots of news came out when this was considered to be approved and available um, for the Russian public uh, a few weeks ago um, when it was also renamed again um, Sputnik 5. And, but what is really highlighted in here is that this has been given conditional registration certificate. Uh, what you can read into that is a conditional registration certificate basically means that they, it's going to get fast track approval after phase three trials. So phase three trials have been initiated with this particular vaccine. Um, again, this one isn't estimated to, uh, to complete until May of, uh, of next year. The next uh, vaccine that has some approval for, uh, and limited use is also from another uh, Chinese company that completed phase one and two trials in June. This one is a little bit different because it's an inactivated coronavirus, uh, it's an inactivated vaccine, meaning that they had to get enough of the virus to be able to inactivate it and then give it a trial. Um, again, these uh, this particular vaccine is being uh, it has a reasonable safety profile, is being uh, trialed in uh, Brazil and Indonesia, as well as China. Um, and the primary focus here is on healthcare workers. Uh, and again, not until September of next year uh, are the uh, evaluation uh, or the primary evaluation and endpoint uh, set. So, just other vaccines that are being reported uh, that are in phase three and we've reported on in this webinar format as well. Um, the first is the CHADOX-1 vaccine that's to the left, uh, that's University of Oxford in partnership with AstraZeneca, and again, focused on the spike protein. Uh, not a whole lot of additional news um, with respect to that one, other than they too are using international partnerships to make sure that this uh, the phase three trial has enough participants and is being evaluated for its reduction of uh, um, patients with COVID-19 as well as a safety profile, again, not until September of next year. Um, and then the Moderna uh, NIH mRNA vaccine, um, again, focused on the spike protein that's not planned for anything else available until uh, October of uh, 2022. I know that a lot of what's being reported is availability of vaccine much sooner than that. Uh, these are the times that are documented as the, each of these phase three studies has been registered. I'm sure that, that we are anticipating changes that will be ongoing with this, but this is what is officially reported um, on the, uh, the reporting website for uh, all phase three vaccines. I do want to provide a little bit of visibility uh, into what's new um, in the vaccine world. And it's uh, really not what's new is, or what's old is new, is really what you would state here. Um, there are uh, laboratories in, here in the United States, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, as well as a number in the Netherlands that are really taking a look at um, the BCG vaccine. Um, now, this isn't specific to COVID, but there are some reports, the one of which from the WHO that indicated that um, the vaccine has off-target effects that uh, improves or reduces virus, uh, the um, incidence of viral respiratory illness in the elderly. And another scientific report that indicated that countries that had a BCG vaccine um, protocol or typically did this, had decreased morbidity and mortality, not morality, <laughs> mortality associated with COVID-19. Um, there is a lot of uh, thought in this because, well, BCG vaccine is immediately available and so therefore potentially beneficial. Um, this would not be a benefit to hospitalized patients or anybody who is considered active disease, um, but it is something that is being explored um, simply to make sure that something is available. But again, these are phase three trials that are being evaluated 
um, currently um, with a shorter timeline. Um, with that, I will end and transition over to uh, Sergio for a discussion on uh, convalescent plasma. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, we're going to talk today on the clinical uh, therapeutic update side on the convalescent plasma. As many of you uh, who are following the news probably um, heard towards the end of, uh, of August, there was a big announcement by President Trump of the authorization of the use of blood plasma in the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, what followed uh, was a lot of controversy, but what we're going to try to do is really focus on what the science is so as clinicians, you know exactly where, where things stand. But uh, next slide, please. I do think that it's worthwhile to mention that there was a very uh, strong letter written by Dr. Topol, who's a Eric Topol, a very recognized scientist and uh, one of the editors of Medscape uh, towards Dr. Han, who's the head of the FDA. And I would encourage our clinical colleagues to take a look at this letter. You have the link there, read through it. So I think it really raises the question of um, the role of politics within this pandemic. And no matter which aisle of the, the political spectrum you, you, you sit on or, or, or believe in, I do believe that ultimately as clinicians, we need to really understand what is political, what is science-based, and what is most important for our patients. So these are some of the points that Dr. Topol um, really pointed out to, uh, to Dr. Han in his announcement and really felt that the FDA was perhaps acting uh, through political uh, motives more than the, than the science and raised some very important questions regarding where we are with evidence and plasma in terms of what the FDA initially um, recommended and stated, which uh, probably was inaccurate and then was retracted. But let's look at what, what the emergency use authorization is and what is the evidence behind it. Next slide, please. This is actually taken from the um, document that the FDA released. The title in yellow is actually the link to that document. So when you get the slides, you can, you can go through that link. And this is just, I mean, the snapshot that talks about the proposed indication of this uh, AUA, which is a uh, EUA, which is basically for patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. So that's an important aspect. The authorization, um, emergency authorization uh, use is for hospitalized patients with documented COVID-19. And what they are proposing is that the patients get um, a dose of um, convalescent plasma of about 200 mLs and that then subsequent doses be uh, prescribed according to medical judgment and patient's clinical response. They also do make a, uh, a mention that patients with impaired cardiac function and heart failure may require smaller doses or more prolonged transfusion times, which is the case for any blood transfusion. So that is what um, is the proposed indication and dosing, which is very nondescript of this uh, emergency use authorization. But let's look a little bit more about uh, regarding the science behind um, plasma. I think that the idea is, uh, is very simple and it's been applied uh, back to 1918 when the um, influenza pandemic hit the world, I mean, with significant strength. And the idea is that you have patients who recover from a disease that's caused by an infectious um, um, agent and uh, develop antibodies. And the idea is that we can get body from those patients who have uh, blood from those patients who have recovered and use those antibodies as neutralizing antibodies in plasma and give that either as prophylaxis for people that have been exposed to COVID-19 or as treatment to those patient, patients who have contracted COVID-19. The idea really is to utilize the antibodies of those recovered uh, uh, patients as we uh, found in the convalescent plasma to combat the disease in, in other patients. So from an immuno, immune standpoint, obviously it does make sense. We do know that there's a lot of diseases in which antibodies make a difference. And that is like the chalkboard rationale behind pursuing convalescent plasma for COVID-19. Let's look at the available evidence. Next slide, please. There is only one published peer-reviewed randomized trial so far with convalescent plasma. 
It is a small study that we have discussed in previous sem uh, webinars. Uh, out of China, 103 patients were randomized to receive either convalescent plasma or um, standard of treatment without plasma. And uh, uh, this study was stopped prematurely before it hit the number that it was uh, powered, uh, powered or calculated to, to achieve power to show a difference because the pandemic had kind of fizzled down in China, they were having a hard time to recruit patients. Now, an important aspect about this particular study is that they did uh, control the titers of antibodies. And even though we don't know which are the best antibodies, just the quality control of the plasma in terms of making sure that the concentration of antibodies is above a, a certain threshold, obviously is a very important aspect of, of utilizing plasma as, as a therapy. And what they had as a primary endpoint was improvement on an ordinal scale, six point ordinal scale of symptoms in these patients. And uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the, the study was not uh, completed uh, with a pre-scheduled um, number of patients. It was stopped prematurely, but it did not re uh, reach its primary outcome. And what it did show was that uh, perhaps the, the, there was no difference in the um, improvement rate between patients who received plasma and the control did not achieve such significance. And when they looked at subgroup analysis, what they did reveal was that perhaps the signal was stronger in patients who were not critically ill or had life-threatening disease. So those who were not in an ICU or on a ventilator seemed to have a greater benefit, if there is any, than those who were extremely ill and had life-threatening di disease defined as a need for mechanical ventilator support or other organ failures. So um, there is another study that has been quoted in the FDA papers as a randomized study. It's not been printed, it's in preprint form. It's a study out of the Netherlands that actually was stopped prematurely after 86 patients were enrolled due to the fact that they found that all the patients even those, uh, all the patients that they enrolled had uh, evidence of antibodies and they felt that it would not be a, a, a valid test in terms of the, uh, testing the hypothesis of whether in giving somebody additional antibodies could make a difference in the clinical scenario. So that study has not been peer reviewed or published, but was also mentioned in the FDA papers. And then a lot of the attributions that were made to plasma and a lot of the discussion around the science behind the, the plasma is uh, in the next slide, please, comes out of a large registry from Mayo Clinic. Uh, you can see the links, uh, the link is uh, there in the slide. This is also a non peer reviewed uh, study at this point. So it has not been published. It's not available in print yet. It's only available in its preprint form. And I think it's very important that there's a lot of value in what the Mayo Clinic registry offers but I don't think that it really is a conclusive in terms of what we should do as bedside clinicians. So let me just walk you through what they did is they, they created an open registry and they have over 30,000 patients that received plasma throughout the United States for COVID-19. Unfortunately, this is not a randomized study. It's not a comparative study. All I did is just basically looked at data from 30,000 patients that received plasma for COVID-19. So there's nothing to compare to. But what they did find was three things that I think are very important. Number one is that the administration of plasma overall is safe within the context of modern um, blood product transfusions. They found that it, it could be done without major side effects. So that's something I think that is a good starting point. And then what they did is they looked at seven day adjusted mortality and 30 day adjusted mortality. This slide shows a seven day adjusted mortality and they looked at it based on two factors. First factor, which is on your left, has to do with the level of IgG groups. So low level is in orange, high levels, which is a higher titer is in medium and then high is in green, which is the highest titer. Just showing that when you compare mortality at seven days based on the concentration of uh, antibodies, IgG antibodies, it seems to correlate with the amount of antibodies, which makes sense, but I think it's an important finding as we design 
future studies. So clearly there's a correlation in terms of the concentration that these plasma allocates can achieve with, with the IgG antibodies. The second thing that they showed, which is on the right, is when they look at those three groups in terms of low, medium, and high concentration of antibodies, but they broke it out in terms of um, when you give the transfusion early in their hospital stay versus late. So three days or less or more than four days. And again, the mortality benefit seems to be more pronounced in those patients who have the highest titers in the early phase of their hospital stay. Suggestion that perhaps, at least from a seven-day adjusted mortality perspective, high titers of antibodies in the plasma given early might be, might be the way to go in these patients. Next slide. The following slide shows the same analysis, but for the 30-day adjusted mortality, which was the second, the, the second primary endpoint, and again, suggesting that there's a correlation with the amount of, uh, of antibodies, higher being better than lower. And then now, when you look at timing early, before three days or within the first few days of hospitalization, probably has a greater effect than when you do it later in the course or four or more days. Now, the, the, the authors of this paper, which is like I mentioned multiple times, is still in preprint format, um, argue that these are important findings that can help guide future clinical trials. But by no means are these findings really robust evidence that plasma works because it was not compared to patients who did not receive plasma. And it is very possible that um, even though these factors determine in which cases the, the mortality with, with patients who receive plasma is lower, we don't know for a fact that receiving plasma helps or hurts these patients. So next slide. Finally, what I wanna share, which is an interesting dichotomy here, is that even though the FDA initially was very bold about the value of plasma improving mortality, in patients with COVID and had to later retract that and really rephrase things in terms of that in one study that, that I just showed you, which is a not published open registry, there seems to be some evidence to suggest that higher titers and earlier might be better. The reality is that we still don't have strong evidence to guide us as clinicians. And as of September 1st, the NIH guidelines um, are very clear that they believe there's insufficient data to recommend e either for, for or against the use of convalescent plasma for the treatment of COVID-19. They believe that this should not be part of standard of care in the patients treated with COVID-19, and that what we need is well-designed, con well controlled prospective data and randomized trials to really understand if there's a role for plasma and what that is. So I think that Unfortunately, the emergency use authorization is not supported by good evidence of outcomes. I think that we are still utilizing plasma in many of our practices. I still encourage our clinicians to use them within a registry or a randomized trial so that we can get the data that is needed. But uh, I do believe that the, the, that the promise of plasma is still not substantiated by evidence and that that is important when we discuss this with family members and with patients, just to explain them where things really stand. So with that, I, I will give uh, the microphone to, to Nate, who will talk about testing update. Thanks, Sergio. So let's talk a little bit about where we are testing-wise. Last week, we came uh, close to a million tests uh, in a week in the US, and you can see that the the blue trend line, which is a seven day moving average or the percent of COVID tests that are positive is trending down nicely and really you know, building on the downward momentum that began in the second week of August. So you know, great, great news there that despite the increased number of tests, we're seeing you know, when you aggregate data across the US, a lower number of tests uh, that are positive. So um, capacity and turnaround time definitely improving you know if you look at the last week as a whole we did 4.7 million tests you know the the rockefeller institute and the harvard school of public health and others have created um, some mathematical analysis around what's required from a testing standpoint to reopen and to implement a test and trace strategy and 
consensus numbers are somewhere between 15 to 30 million tests per week. So we're still obviously very short of that number. And when you think about you know where the supply chain bottlenecks are for the common PCR testing, PCR testing is not gonna get us to where we need to be from a testing standpoint. The good news is that um, saliva-based tests and pooled testing, as well as you know, point of care antigen testing have uh, the ability to get us there. There's also some pockets of the country that have you know really poor testing turnaround and very high positivity rates and just data that isn't great. Alabama would be kind of the archetype for that dynamic today. So another thing that's interesting to look at is how the case fatality rate has progressed over time. <clears throat> And what you see here is that the red tracing is the worldwide case fatality rate. And uh, the blue tracing is the US. And you see that you know early in the pandemic, you had you know incomplete testing, a lot of cases that weren't identified and a case fatality rate that was very high. And as testing has become more prevalent, we're seeing that kind of regress um, down to a, a number of about 3%, which I think we're just below in the US in the most recent data. So something that's very uh, interesting and also concerning is this idea of reinfection. And you know, once you've recovered from COVID-19, can you acquire it again? The answer appears to be yes. Now, there's um, the first case report was a 33-year-old male who had COVID-19 confirmed by PCR testing, recovered, and then um, was screened when he was asymptomatic. He was going through Hong Kong airport, and he tested positive. His, um, you know, he had pretty substantial serology testing and a, really a fair amount of testing done, which allowed the the genome of the virus that caused the original infection and the virus that was present when he was screened in Hong Kong airport to be sequenced. And then those two sequences were compared. And it does seem that there's enough genetic heterogeneity between the two viruses that this likely represented a reinfection rather than a recurrence. Um, although, you know, the virus can certainly mutate when someone's infected with it, although the time gap, along with the differences in um, the virus genome, you know, really suggests that this is reinfection. The, and, you know, his clinical course with the second infection is reassuring and kind of what, you know, the, the traditional teaching would be in that, you know, if you have some, you know, substantial and brisk antibody response to a virus your body's familiar with, you know, certainly you could be rechallenged. And if the virus is different enough genetically, you know, hopefully your neutralizing antibodies will still clear the infection. And that may be what happened in this case. There's a US case reported of a 25 year old immunocompetent man in uh, Reno, Nevada. And on March 25, he had sore throat, cough, headache, nausea. And, you know, a couple of weeks later was tested by PCR, tested positive for COVID 19. About um, nine days later, his symptoms had resolved completely. And he then had subsequent two negative uh, PCR swabs. On May the 28th, he had onset of pretty similar symptoms to the first time, had a chest X-ray, which was negative. His symptoms worsened. He was hypoxic. He got admitted to the hospital, developed some new infiltrates, and his PCR uh, was positive. And he didn't have... Uh, serology and antibody testing with the initial uh, bout, but did have it the second time. And he did also have the the virus that caused the initial bout of infection in March and the subsequent illness in the end of May and June was sequenced. And there's sufficient difference in the, the sequence of those two viral genomes to suggest that this is recurrent infection. So there are other, I just highlight those two. The one from uh, the initial case report is interesting because it's the first one and because the, the clinical phenotype of the disease is what you might expect with a viral reinfection. The second case from the US really raises some more questions because the, you know, the, his clinical course with the reinfection was actually somewhat worse than it was with the first case. I think regardless of what all this means, it's important to keep 
this in perspective. You know, despite the fact that there's a, a growing number of case reports, it appears that this is not a common phenomenon. There are 27.5 million documented cases as of uh, earlier today, and really only a few reports of reinfection, and the majority of those reports suggest a benign course with reinfection. Now, this really does raise a lot of questions. You know, how, how does reinfection happen and, wh and why does it happen? Does it have something to do with mutation in the virus? Does it have something to do with the size of inoculum that you get? And we, we don't really know the answer to that. I think the second question, evidence would suggest that the, you know, reinfection is gonna be less severe, but the truth is we don't really know. More interesting is, you know, once you have reinfection, how infectious are you? You know, if you have a benign clinical course, are you still viremic enough and expelling viral particles in a way that will result in meaningful transmission? I don't know that we know the answer to that. You know, the another consideration is how does what impact does reinfection have for uh, policies about screening people who've already recovered from COVID-19? You know, as you may remember, um, in the mid-summer, the FDA really abandoned their kind of test-based strategy for folks returning to work, and they they really didn't recommend PCR testing as a test of cure because you had people that were expelling what was felt to be kind of inactive um, viral particles that weren't infectious, but they would still test positive for fragments of the um, the genome of the virus. So they would have, you know, there'd be a subset of patients that would be persistently positive for months. And how do you separate that from reinfection? I, I don't know that we really know the answer to that. I think the other thing that comes into question here is there's been a lot of talk of, well, do you need some kind of immunity passport to, you know, be able to travel safely, you know, particularly internationally? And if reinfection is possible, I think that becomes a less defensible strategy for reopening international travel. And then finally, you know, what are the implications for vaccine uh, efficacy, I don't know that we really know. There are certainly, you know, cases like the HPV vaccine model where vaccine immunity is actually substantially stronger than natural immunity that uh, you acquire after, you know, successfully, um, you know, combating infection with HPV. So I don't think we really know the answer. You know, like many, um, like many pieces of science with this novel coronavirus, there's a lot that we don't know here and certainly something that we wanna keep an eye on, but I, I felt like there was enough information that it would be productive to talk about it today. So shifting gears, I think, you know, when you look at the, uh, the mortality there's, that's occurred in the US, there's, you know, a pretty substantial gap in the, the observed excess mortality and the number of deaths that are attributed to the virus. You know, there's, depending on which, whose statistics you use, there's probably 40,000 or so excess deaths in the US. And I think in time, we may know more about, you know, how much of that is due to avoiding necessary care or delaying procedures that were kind of semi-elective or non-compliance with treatment plans because of difficulty with access during the restrictions that related to the pandemic, or is it due to exacerbation or a new onset of mental illness and subsequent downstream effects of that? You know, the, there's a, a study in JAMA last week that really took a look at this. And basically what they did is they looked at two large survey-based uh, samplings of population one pre-pandemic and one, you know, contemporaneous with the restrictions of the pandemic, and they, and they looked at 1,441 people and and then compared them to a a much larger pre-pandemic control group, and the results really aren't surprising in terms of their direction, but they are surprising to me at least in terms of their magnitude. And what you found in the, you know, the the I don't even know what the ruling is and what color that is. I guess that's like a dark green, and I, I don't know what the other one is. We'll call that light green. But the in pre-COVID, you could see really the overwhelming majority of adults don't have depressive symptoms. But during COVID-19, during that um, you know survey period, the balance shifts so that actually the majority of adults surveyed in the US have some at least mild depressive symptoms. And the magnitude of um, 
increase in the various cohorts is what's really impressive to me. Mild depressive disease, about a 1.5x increase, moderate 2.6x, moderately severe 3.7x, and then severe seven and a half times more common in the, you know, the during the pandemic survey. And I think what we do know from what's known about this topic is that depression is clearly a leading cause for disability. It's definitely a major risk factor for suicide, but it's also, there's really good literature to suggest that it's remarkably sensitive to social determinants of health. And unfortunately, populations that are already challenged through, um, you know, cultural issues or monetary barriers or unemployment are disproportionately affected, you know, in this survey. So, so what do we do with this information? I think really now we need to be, this needs to be, I think, near the top of the list of expected consequences as we um, navigate waxing and waning disease prevalence in the communities we serve. And it, I think it also means that we need to redouble the vigilance with which we're watching each other. And to that end, in looking through some material on the IDSA website, I came across a resource that I think aggregates uh, some things that are pretty useful. And this isn't patient facing, this is clinician facing. And I know many of you share the same sentiment that, that I do about some of the things that have um, come out recently from the CDC. And I'm, I'm having a little bit less faith in them as a organization. And in looking toward other places, one of the, the places that I really like the information they're putting out is the Infectious Disease Society of America, the IDSA. And they've come out with a, a PDF that's one page that aggregates resources for clinicians. And, you know, the idea with these well-being resources is not that, you know, everyone on the list is going to be great for everybody, but it's more that by providing a menu of options and showing people what's out there, you can find something that resonates with you and helps you or helps someone on your team. So what this does is goes through, you know, we've pointed out and later in this deck, there are some contact numbers for uh, resources, but there's some really good online resources. The AMA has, uh, you know, managing mental health during COVID-19, which is offers kind of actionable tactics for managing yourself during the pandemic. The American Psychological Association has the same thing. UCLA Health also has something. And the, you know, there are one group that people maybe haven't talked about as much, but are really impacted by this are family members of caregivers. You know, obviously the caregivers are tremendously impacted, but um, what about their families? And, you know, the Center for uh, the Study of Traumatic Stress has, uh, you know, some practical tips and guidance. And the, the reason why I like a lot of these links is because they provide actionable things that you can do. You know, they're not just kind of a discussion of what's happening or an enumeration of statistics. They actually provide, um, you know, meaningful tactics. So we've talked about some of the available things. I love the name of this, the Emotional PPE project. Um, I think who, whoever came up with that uh, deserves some kudos. So this will be distributed in the show notes for this episode and is something I would encourage you to share with your team. And again, you know, know upfront that all these tactics are not going to resonate with everyone, but there are certainly a few that may be useful to some. And with that in mind, I'm going to highlight again our um, sound physician uh, peer support program championed by our own Mark Rudolph. Um, available clinicians, um, you know, can call the 800 number. It's available 24-7. We have our EAP program. And then we also have this uh, physician support line, which is external to sound, put together by psychiatrists who are volunteering their time. They continue to expand. This is a great uh, resource. The Wellbeing Portal, aggregates well-being information that is uh, constantly curated and updated as we learn more. And, um, you know, before we transition to talk a little bit about PP and questions, I would really encourage everyone in the audience, if you come across something that you know has helped you or, you know, kind of helped you recharge your batteries or something that might be useful to others uh, in our group, please share it. You know, send a note to Sergio or send a note to Greg or send a note to me and let, let us know what's working for you. What's something that helped you? Because we would love to share that with others in the group. 
I'd also like to take a moment, you know, certainly supply chain for PPE has improved pretty dramatically compared to where we were in March and early April. But we do have, as you see in uh, navy blue on the left side of this slide, the ability to request PPE for distribution. We still have stock of KN95 masks. Your RMD can escalate that to the appropriate service line CMO and we can get it to you. With that being said, I think we've actually saved some time for, for questions. So, um, Stephen, I'm not sure if you can see questions in the chat or if we don't have any, we can give folks some time back. I would, um, you know, coming from me, want to close with the usual thank you for what you're you're doing. I know that there's there's really never been a time, you know, in our lifetimes where what we do has been more important to the community we serve. So, thank you. There are no questions at this time, but we'll give everyone just a moment. You know, while while we're waiting to see if we get any questions via chat, I don't know, Mark, did you have any closing comments? Well, Nate, I, I appreciate the, um, you know, these are really great resources. And as Nate pointed out, not everything is going to work just as well for each individual. So it is it is worth taking a look through the different kinds of things that are out there and, and also keeping in mind that a lot of these resources, they're not solely designed for some kind of big bang crisis or problem that, that you may be experiencing. Um, you know, I, as that study that Nate shared with us pointed out, you know, many of us are experiencing depressive symptoms and understandably so. And so uh, utilizing these resources is something that I, I think we can all feel empowered to do and comfortable. And um, there's actually going to be a message, a well-being message going out later today about how to find a therapist. And I think, you know, utilizing the services of a therapist is the kind of thing that probably all of us could benefit from. I'm not saying that that folks need to. However, I think those that want to can feel comfortable um, that it's an okay thing to do, even if you've never done it before. And so I encourage people to just, as Nate pointed out, take take a look through what's available and, and see if there's something that's right for you. Greg, do you have any closing comments for us? I do not. I, I think that what you shared, Nate, and um, Mark, what you, you <clears throat> backed up with are, are fantastic uh, thoughts and comments that we should all be considering. And um, I want to reiterate what you stated, Nate, which is that um, while we're talking about external resources, we want to also um, underscore the fact that uh, we are all human beings um, that happen to be in the same boat and should you choose to reach out we certainly want to make sure that we're responding and helping uh, in any way that we can sergio echo the thanks uh, that we uh, give every every webinar to our uh, bedside clinicians for all the amazing work and i think uh, uh, just to remind everybody that not only uh, important, I mean, to seek help when we need it with all the resources that were shared, but also to remember the power that each one of us has to help one of our colleagues and just sometimes lending a, a listening ear, just talking about certain things can make a difference for somebody else. So not forget, I mean, that no matter where we are, uh, we can always lift ourselves by lifting those around us. Well, thank you, Sergio. Stephen, have we uh, acquired any questions through the chat? Uh, we do. We have a couple of questions coming through. Um, first question is, given the information provided regarding clinical trials ending next year, is there any recommendation to take any vaccines rushed through this year? Safety? So I, I don't know that we have any additional information with respect to uh, what's, you know, the potential for vaccines that are, you know, being rushed. I know that uh, a number of pharmaceutical companies have provided uh, 
a statement of assurance to the public about the fact that safety will not be uh, what well, will be considered um, in the hope of making sure that people have some level of confidence in the vaccine. Uh, I think from my perspective, the part of the reason we wanted to share that is that there is a lot of information that's being circulated out there about uh, the fact that um, that a vaccine may be available, um, including this year. I want to underscore the fact that um, everything that's occurring with uh, any type of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is being done in a compressed timeline. It's typically seven years till a vaccine is available for the general public. Um, and a lot of the information that we're receiving uh, are, you know, even the phase one and phase two studies uh, as reported in the prior webinar, um, you know, the results that we have are typically 60 to maybe 90 days out. And obviously there are concerns about both short and long-term consequences. Uh, I think it's in, incumbent upon us all to be as vigilant as we can in terms of the research. We want to recognize the fact that because of uh, the original SARS uh, as well as MERS, there is some indication that what was being evaluated for vaccines before can certainly accelerate where we are now, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should uh, accept everything that's coming through. And so we have to make sure that the process uh, in evaluating the safety profiles of all of these uh, va potential vaccines, as well as their overall efficacy, um, needs to be evaluated. So that's probably a long way of not answering the question <laughs> directly, um, but I, I, for one, am making sure that uh, we're evaluating things uh, as uh, in-depth as possible and then reporting it out so that way everybody has the facts. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh... I'm in the Pfizer trial now. How could it possibly be ready by mid-October when it is not even fully enrolled? I was told next year sometime at the earliest. Just got my second injection last week. Yeah, I saw that. I do have questions about anything else that's coming uh, out. Um, and you're correct. If you look at clinicaltrials.gov and uh, you can track any of these, you're right. Um, people are tracking the various stages of enrollment. Uh, I know that um, because a lot of these are, uh, studies are being done internationally, people are uh, evaluating things uh, on the fly. And so uh, different level of protocols, there are actually different primary and secondary outcomes for each of the phase three trials. And so again, I would encourage people to go to clinicaltrials.gov. You can look up what's in phase three trials uh, currently to determine the endpoints and also to evaluate whether or not they are fully enrolled because that will be a significant question um, when people are evaluating the data. Thank you. Um, the next one, it, it isn't so much a question uh, as just a, a statement. Um, Santosh Kale, chief at Shoreline, uh, says that the physician wellness program started at Shoreline, 30 minute calls per week for physicians to get together. More of a, an announcement, it sounds like, and that is all we have. Well, thanks, Stephen, for your expert facilitation, as always, and thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we will um, bring you more content again sometime soon. Remember that, you know, we we curate this for you, so if there's a topic that you want covered or a, a gap you see in what's out there, uh, please reach out and let us know. All right. Thank you, everybody.